Hello, let me introduce uh, Annabelle Gillet. She is a PhD student at the LIB Laboratory, a computer science laboratory at the University of Burgundy in France. Hello. I'm Eric Leclerc, associate professor at the LIB. We are working on the big data analytics frameworks and the data centric software architectures. Today, we will present the Tensor Data Model Library. Our talk is divided in four parts. In the first part, we will give an overview of tensors and their capabilities. We are going to show how they can be used as pivot model, but also that there are more than only multidimensional arrays as they are seen in some machine learning libraries. We will focus on a specific kind of operators that are powerful data mining tools, the tensor decomposition. We will outline the limits of tensor libraries, mainly the absence of type safety and the lack of consideration for data. In the second part, we are going to present the tensor data model library, its type safety, its internals, its data manipulation operators, and its decomposition. TDM has been designed with uh, two main objectives. First, to build a data-centric library to help developers to work with different kinds of data. The second objective is to propose a safe and user-friendly way to use tensors. In the first part of the talk, we will show how tensors can be used for data mining. We will develop two examples, one to detect communities and another one to detect anomalies. In the last part, after the conclusion, we will draw a roadmap of uh, our future development. We start with an intuitive definition of the notion of tensors, notion that was introduced at the end of the 19th century. A tensor is a multidimensional structure with strong mathematical properties. The number of dimensions of a tensor is called order or mode. A zero-order tensor is a scalar, a one-order tensor is a vector, a two-order tensor is a matrix, and so on. If a three-order tensor is easy to visualize, Higher order tensors are much more difficult to represent, but a four order tensor can be seen as a list of three order tensors. If we take a five order tensor, we can see it either as a list of four order tensors or as a matrix of three order tensors. From the developer's point of view, tensors are multidimensional arrays. Their shape includes both the number of dimensions and the length of each dimension. The order of their dimensions is fixed at the creation, and the values of the tensor are accessed with integers representing the indexes of each dimension. With their modeling capabilities, tensors can be seen as pivot models. They can naturally represent relational data, graphs, time series. We will show some examples in the next slide. This flexibility allows to use them in various domains, such as brain signal analysis, chemoinformatics, or seismology. Moreover, they are not just multidimensional arrays and have powerful operators that can be used for data mining. So, take for example uh, the relational model. Consider a table storing the salary of developers with additional information such as the country, the age, and the programming language used. A group by SQL query allows to compute the average salary depending on the country, age, and programming language. And the result can be represented in a three-order tensor. So, a n-order tensor is equivalent to a table with n columns, which are in the primary key, and a column, which is the value. A graph can also be represented as a tensor. The adjacency matrix is already a two-order tensor. Rows and columns represent the nodes, and the values are those of the weight of the links, if there exists one between the two nodes. So, the weight and the direction of the graph can be directly represented in the adjacency matrix. Temporal graph can also be represented using tensors by just adding the time as the third dimension. It is like extending the adjacency matrix with a layer for each time slice. It is more convenient way to manipulate temporal graph than to make a simple list of adjacency matrices. More generally, labeled graph 
can also be represented as tensors. They can be multilabeled, and each type of label constitutes a dimension. Actually, temporal graph can be seen as labeled graph, with the label being the temporal indication. Modeling a time series in tensor is also very interesting because it allows to see variables all together in the same structure. They can be considered in a wall rather than individually. In, order, in the following example, we represent a spatial temporal measure of different sensors in a free order tensor. Different operators are associated to tensors. Some can be used to extract and manipulate data, for example, to modify the number of dimensions. Some others can reshape tensors in order to facilitate development of algorithms. And some advanced operators, such as decomposition, allows to compress and factorize data to reduce the complexity of the tensor. The matrixization consists in exploding the tensor in slices and appending them to create a matrix. This reshaping of tensors is useful to perform matrix multiplications, such as Catrirao or Adama, directly on tensors. The mode of the matrixization allows to choose on which dimension to perform the operation. It is used, for example, to compute decompositions. The decompositions are really interesting operators. They are extension of the matrix factorization used to build recommender systems and they are also close to the singular value decomposition for multidimensional structures. Several decompositions exist, such as Condecom Parafac, Tucker, or Dedicom. If we take the Condecom Parafac, for example, it allows to factorize the tensor into sets of vectors with one vector per dimension. The number of sets is defined by the rank of the decomposition. It is useful for compressing data, but also for revealing patterns hidden in data. From these sets of vectors, we can reconstruct a tensor close to the original one by performing an addition of the outer products between the vectors of each set. The outer product takes two tensors as input and produces a tensor which order is the sum of the order of the input tensors. Take for example the outer product for two vectors, it will produce a matrix. The strength of the decomposition comes from its capability to give a result that takes into consideration all the dimensions at the same time. To interpret the Cordecom Parafac decomposition, we look at the values in each vector. The higher ones are those that contribute the most in the rank. A rank represents a signal in the tensor. A signal can gain in intensity if there are a lot of elements of a dimension that have a similar behavior in the other dimensions. It can also gain in intensity if a particular element of a dimension has high values in the tensor and stands out compared to the other elements. We are going to see how we can leverage those differences in the third part of the presentation. So let's have a look uh, at the different use of the decomposition. First, it can detect anomalies in a dataset. For example, it has been used to detect attacks in a network. The dataset is modeled by a free order tensor representing connection between a source IP address and a destination IP address at a given timestamp. In this case, the decomposition identifies the strong signals that stand out compared to the normal network traffic. It can also be used to detect community structures by finding dense subtensors inside the original tensor. It benefits from a more detailed interpretation than the traditional community detection algorithm developed for graphs, such as the Louvain algorithm, mainly because complementary attributes from the context can be directly integrated into the tensors and so into the result of the decomposition. It is also very useful when analyzing social data network data, such as tweets, where users have multiple kinds of interaction such as retweet, mention, use of hashtags. All of these interactions can be modeled together in a tensor, and thus communities of users can be, can be characterized by the hashtag they use. So instead of having just a list of users in a community, it also gives the hashtag used by all the community. This enhances the interpretability of the results by domain experts. 
Tensor decomposition are also used for brain signal analysis. The basic representation of a brain signal is a matrix with a dimension for the brain location and another one for the time. With Tensor, a more, more detailed modeling can be done, for example, by adding different patients or by adding the type of the stimulus. It uh, can help for the diagnosis of a disease or for studying complex phenomena involving multi-signal and samples. To summarize, tensors are a good pivot model to represent various data models, including relational data, graphs. They are interesting mathematical objects. They, are, they have powerful operators, such as the Condecom Parafact decomposition, which allows to find strong signal in multidimensional data represented as a tensor. However, this is a mathematical point of view. If we see tensor with a programming point of view, they are far away from data and they lack a schema. Moreover, they are not type safe, they are error prone, and they are, they are created and manipulating with integral indexes for identifying dimension as well as for identifying values of dimension. To remember the meaning of a tensor, developers are forced to use by coding habits such as writing comments only to describe the structure and the content of a tensor. When interpreting the result of tensor operators, the risk of having switched to dimension is not negligible. Error in tensor manipulation can induce misinterpretation of the results. This kind of error cannot be seen at the execution because the computation is technically correct but uh, functionally incorrect. Existing uh, tensor libraries can be classified into three categories. Mathematical libraries such as Tensor Toolbox, Tensor Lab, or Tensor Lee that provide most of uh, tensor operators. However, they stick to their mathematical point of view or they are not data oriented. Values must be manipulated uh, through integer indexes and there is uh, no type safety. The second category is one with machine learning libraries, for example TensorFlow or PyTorch. Most of them consider tensors only as multidimensional arrays and use them to convey data task between tasks in a workflow. They often lack operators such as decomposition. The last category is the one with a specific library that proposes only a small subset of operators it includes, at, it includes ATEN, Big Tensor, Samba 10. They are often research-oriented, and their purpose is uh, usually to prove the efficiency of a specific algorithm. As a conclusion, tensor libraries are not data-centric, and they severely lack of type safety. That's why we propose TDM, a tensor data model. In this section, we explain the purpose of TDM, then we present how to use it, and we give an overview of its internals and its operators. The aim of TDM is to provide a type-safe and data-centric tensor library. We want to avoid the tedious mapping that developers must maintain between real values that contain the meaning of an attribute and integer indexes. The type safety is of primary importance. We should be able to use tensors or multidimensional arrays without worrying if the dimension we use is the one we intended to use. So, in TDM, dimensions are much more than just indexes. They are first-class citizens that add meaning to a tensor and that allows to check advanced constraints on the application of an operator. We also want the implementation to be efficient at large scale. And above all that, we want a library that does not act as a black box, but rather that provides users with data manipulation and analytical operators, and that explain how to use them and interpret the results. TDM is still a young library under development. We would like to rely on our research work to improve TDM and to make available efficient ways to use tensors. With TDM, it is possible to manipulate tensors in a type-safe way and without giving importance to the order of dimensions. The first step to build a tensor is to create its dimensions. Each dimension is a phantom type that extends the class tensor dimension with a parameterized type that represents the type of the values of the dimension. 
For example, we can create the dimension of usernames that would be of type string. This representation of dimensions has several advantages. First, each dimension has a meaningful name contrary to integer indexes usually used to manipulate tensor. It also allows to control more finally dimensions by accepting only once the phantom type, but several times the same basic type. In the example on the slide, we have two dimensions with values of type string, user or dash type, but each one of them is a different phantom type. Finally, phantom types can be shared across tensors, and by using types to represent dimensions, we can apply advanced constraints on the use of operators to guarantee a strong type safety even at the schema granularity. So once, once dimensions are created, we can use them to build a tensor. For this, we start at line 5 with a tensor builder that takes a parameterized type that will be the type of the tensor values. We then add each dimension one by one, and we build the tensor by invoking the corresponding function at line 9. An entry of a tensor is composed of dimensions values and of tensor values. The tensor values are indexed by the dimension values. We can manually add entries into the tensors, as we can see at line 11 and 13. It is a fully type-safe operation, as it directly links each dimension to its value. Dimension can be provided in any order. Another way of populating a tensor with entries is to create it from a Spark data frame. To do so, uh, the tensor builder takes uh, the data frame as parameter and each dimension is mapped to the name of the column that represents it in the data frame. When building the tensor, we have to specify the column that is used to store the value of the tensor. Once the tensor is created, it is manipulated the same way if it was created from a data frame or not. By doing so, we benefit from all the Spark connectors for database or files, and we can load data in tensor very easily. Type safety is very important in TDM. We rely on shapeless to have a precise control on it. In TDM, tensors have a schema. This schema is represented with a page list that allows to keep the detail of each type in the list. By leveraging implicits, we can apply strong constraints when using operators. We can also infer the schema when the operator alters the schema of the tensor on which it is applied. For example, when joining two tensors, the resulting tensor will have all the dimensions of both tensors in its schema with no duplicate. This is done without intervention of the user. You don't have to give the new schema, as it is the case, for example, with Spark dataset on case class. The edge list will be constructed automatically and will keep the detail of each dimension. With this mechanism, the type safety will carry on, even after complex manipulations of tensors. In this slide, there are several examples of, of errors detected at compile time. They only concern the creation of a tensor and the addition of values, but there are similar constraints for all the operators. Take a look at line 3. We see that we can't add a dimension that is already in the tensor. With the edge list representing the schema of the tensor, we can keep the detail of each dimension and we can know if a given dimension is in the tensor or not. At line 7, the code doesn't compile because the value for the dimension hashtag is missing. A tensor entry is complete only when all the dimensions have a value. At line 8, the value given for the dimension type is of type uh, for the dimension time is of type string, but it should be of type long. At line 9, this time the value of the tensor is of type string rather than long. So, by using a H list, we can detect a large range of mistakes at compile time rather than at execution time. Furthermore, this type safety works with any number of dimensions. To store the entries of a tensor, TDM uses the data frame from Spark. It allows to benefit from the efficiency and the distributed capabilities of Spark and does, not done, and does not add an overhead compared to the execution of Spark alone. For the advanced operators such as the decomposition, we use the machine learning part of Spark 
more specifically the block matrix, that efficiently distribute matrix operations. We add some operations to block matrix when it is necessary. The operator of a TDM can be split in two categories, the data manipulation operators and the tensorial operators. The data manipulation operators are close to both of the databases, like join or union. We will show them in the next slide. The projection operator focuses on one element of a given dimension and removes the dimension from the tensor. As a consequence, it reduces the order of the tension by one, of the tensor by one. To use it, we have to give a dimension that is in the schema of the tensor and with a value of the right time. Otherwise, it won't compact. To give an example of the projection, we take a free order tensor with, with the dimension user hashtag on time. To represent the tensor on the slide, we put only non-null values in a table, where each line represents an entry of the tensor, and the last column is the value associated to this entry. We apply the projection operator on one dimension user with the value u1. In result, we get a two-order tensor with dimension hashtag on time, and with the entry that had the value u1 for the dimension user, in the original tensor. The restriction operator allows to filter the values of one or more dimensions. For each dimension on which we want to filter, we must give a parameter function that takes in input a parameter of the type of the dimension and that outputs a boolean. To create this function, dimensions have an helper function named condition that is used to guarantee the type's safety. Contrary to the projection operator, the restriction operator doesn't remove dimensions. It only filters the entries of the tensor to keep those that match the given condition. If we take the same tensor example as the previous operator, if we filter to keep only the values of the dimension user that are equal to u1 and the values of the dimension hashtag that are equal to h1, it results in a tensor with only one entry. The selection is also an operator that uh, filters the entries, but this time on the values of the tensor, rather than on the values of the dimension. To apply it, we have to define the parameter function that uh, takes as input a parameter of the type of the tensor values and that outputs a boolean. If we apply uh, the selection operator on the user hashtag time tensor, to keep only the values of the tensor that are greater than 10, we have just one entry left. The union and intersection operators are also available. We can apply them on two tensors that have the same schema, even if the order of the dimensions is not the same. The union keeps all the entries of both tensors. The intersection keeps only the entries for which dimensions values exist in both tensors. These two operators take a parameter function that is applied on the values of the tensor when the dimensions values are the same. For example, we create a new tensor to perform the union with our previous tensor. We have one entry that has the same dimensions values in both tensors, the one with user u2, hashtag h2, and time4. When performing the union, it will result in a tensor with seven entries. The entries with the same dimensions values are merged by adding the values of both original tensors to obtain the new tensor value. The intersection has a similar behavior, except that only the entries that exist in the two tensors are kept. You know, in our example, we keep only the entry with user u2, hashtag h2, and time4, and we apply the same function on the tensor values. The natural join allows to merge two tensors that have at least one dimension in common. As for the union and the intersection, a parameter function is given to determine the type, to determine the value of the new tensor from both of the input tensor. For example, if we want to use, if we want to join the tensor user hashtag time with a tensor user email, and to keep the values of the tensor user hashtag time, we will have a result tensor with four dimensions, user, hashtag, time, and email, with the values of the first tensor. It is similar to an in-and-join. 
Finally, the difference removes the entries from the first answer that also exist in the second answer. Just like the union and the intersection, both tensors must have the same schema. If we get back to the example, the resulting tensor will have three entries. The entry with user u2, hashtag h2, on time 4 is also existing in tensor 2, so it is removed. The data manipulation operators are useful to alter the tensor and make it suitable for further processing. We can do so with the tensorial operators. Currently, we have only the condecom paraphrase decomposition. Nevertheless, we plan to add more, such as the Tucker decomposition or the higher order singular value decomposition. As we said at the beginning of the presentation, the condecom paraphrase decomposition, also called canonical polyadic decomposition, outputs one set of vectors for each rank. In TDM, to manipulate its results more easily and to keep the type safety even after the execution of the decomposition, we output a special class that contains a two-order tensor by dimension of the original tensor. The dimensions are though of these two-order tensors are the original concern dimension and the dimension called rank. Each two-order tensor can be extracted from this special class and then be manipulated as a normal tensor. The values of in these vectors represent the implication of each element in the rank. In the example of the slide, if we take the dimension hashtag, we can see that in the first rank, the value h1 is the main value, and in the second rank, it is the value h2. If you want to interpret the first rank completely, we see that the values are balanced for the user dimension, with u1 a little more present than, a, than u2, that the hashtag h1 is more largely used than h2, and that the time is balanced between the two time slices. Tensor mathematical libraries often result in an out-of-memory error when performing the decomposition at large scale. But with TDM, we use the Spark block matrix to implement efficiently the condecom paraphrase decomposition, even at large scale. We compare the execution time of TDM to those of the baseline of distributed decomposition. Aten and big tensor that run on Hadoop, and some button on CSTF that are Spark implementations. TDM outperforms the other libraries, the figure as a log scale. For a small tensor with a thousand entries, TDM takes few seconds to run the decomposition, and for a tensor of one billion of elements, it takes one hour. As a condecom paraphrase decomposition is an iterative algorithm, the execution times are more than reasonable. Now that we have uh, seen how TDM works, we will show some examples of how to use and interpret the condecom paraphrase decomposition. To demonstrate the capabilities of the decomposition to find communities, we use a dataset of interaction in a primary school in France during two days. The student and the teacher wear a RFID uh, device that records interaction of at least 20 seconds. An interaction is considered as a contact in a range of one meter. In this school, there are 10 classes of five levels, from first grade to fifth grade. It represents a total of 242 students and 10 teachers. The dataset is available as a CVS file. Each line contains uh, the ID of uh, both persons in interaction as well as the time of the interaction. During school time, we can distinguish uh, two main periods. So during classes, on the break times, that happen at lunch, in the middle in, of the morning, and uh, on the afternoon. As we can see on the slide, during classes, the interactions are mainly between the students of the same class. During the breaks, it's much more mixed, and students interact each with each other regardless of their grade, even if there is more interaction among, among students of the same age. To perform our decomposition, we first load the CSV file into a data frame. We perform basic manipulations. We change the time slices from 20 seconds to 5 minutes, 
and we opened the class and the student ID to make them more readable. Currently, those, these operations are done directly on the data frame, but we plan to add more data manipulation operators into TDM in the future, such as the map operators. When the data frame is ready, you can transform it into a transfer. We create the dimensions, two for the students and one for the time. We map each dimension to its column name and we build the tensor. We can look at the decomposition. We choose 13 ranks. The norm that you see as a parameter is the one used to normalize each vector returned by the decomposition. You can choose the norm. Presently, the major norms, L1 and L2, are implemented. And this is it. This is all the code you have to write to use the decomposition. When it is over, we can extract the result for each dimension in order to manipulate it more easily. Now that we have performed the decomposition, we can interpret its result. This figure shows the result of the decomposition. Each line represents a rank and each column a student or a teacher. The students appear by class order. We have first the students of the class 1A, then 1B, and so on. At the end of the line, there is the teachers. The highest values of each rank are close to the color red. We can see that the decomposition outputs one community by class, including the teacher, and that there is three communities with students from different classes. We can also see that some classes have more links with a particular class than others. It is the case for the classes 3A and 3B. With the decomposition, we can get overlapping communities, but its main advantage comes from its capability to contextualize the communities. When we built the tensor, we included a time dimension. So, for each rank, we also have one vector that describes the time attributes for the identified community. In the figure, we can see the time dimension at the top, split into the two days, Day 1 is at the left, and day 2 is at the right. At the bottom, the students with the higher values are represented. By using this information, we can see, for example, that the communities of the classes appear more, mostly during class hours and less during the breaks, especially the lunch break. The one on the slide is for the class 1B. The result is similar for all the classes. For example, we showed this time the class 4A. It has the same temporal behavior than the class 1B. And we can also see that there is no activity the second day in the afternoon. If we check in the dataset, there is no interaction at all for the students of this class for this time. They were maybe at an outdoor activity that broke them outside of the range of the RFID sensors. The second type of community that the decomposition has detected shows a specific time signature. We can clearly see that this type of community appears only during the break times and more importantly during the lunch hour. So the decomposition is a great tool for community detection that can add some contextual information that we can't have with classical community detection methods used on graphs, such as Luga, for example. The Codecom Parafact decomposition can also be used for anomaly detection. To demonstrate it, we use the DARPA 1998 dataset. It is a dataset with seven weeks of network traffic used for testing intrusion detection algorithms. We use a version of the dataset already formatted as a CSV file with three attributes, the source IP, the destination IP, and the time of the connection. The beginning of the dataset is the first day of June, and it ends, it ends the 19th of July. The list of attacks that happen during this period is online, this is the ground truth, so it's easy to check if we find it, what we find is an attack or not. To prepare the dataset, we first have to get back to the real values, as the version we used was split in three files, one containing the main dataset, but with uh, indexes for other dimension values, and two others to map the indexes to their real values. We perform a join to reconstruct the dataset. We then aggregate the connection for each minute, 
and uh, we send a number of connections that happen during this time window. Now that uh, our dataset is uh, ready, we can load it to a tensor. This step is similar to the one we performed for the primary school dataset. The result is quite different. Only specific elements have a high value in this decomposition result. More specifically, we can see one source IP address on one destination associated to a spike in time. If we zoom on the time dimension to see more precisely the moment corresponding to the spike, we can see that it happens the 19th of June. If we check the list of attacks, there is one match, the Juarez Master attack. The time, the source and the destination correspond exactly at the specification of the attack. We can identify other attacks in more ranks of the decomposition. This one, for example, are more spikes than the previous one. If we zoom on the two more important, we can see that they are different than the Juarez Master attack. They last approximately usually one hour with phases of five minutes. In the list of attacks, we found that they correspond to two attacks that match your result. They are perpetrated by the same source and against the same target. The time behavior is interesting because the description of this attack indicates that ports from 1 to 124 were accessed during one hour every five minutes. And that corresponds exactly to the phases of the result of the decomposition. Some ranks gather multiple attacks. In this one, for example, all the highest values of the source dimensions are attackers. They are directed against one destination. Most of the attacks are denials of service. Even in a large temporality of seven weeks, the decomposition is able to find similar attacks and to highlight them at the exact time of the attack. Furthermore, all the source IP addresses are of interest, as they are all authors of multiple attacks and should be watched. So, the Conecomparafal decomposition is efficient to find anomalies in a dataset. The difference of uh, using it for community detection or for anomaly detection is the modeling of the tensor. Actually, the decomposition finds strong signals in a tensor. In the primary school dataset, we put all the values of the tensor at 1. So, a strong signal is a subpart of the tensor where there are a lot of interactions between a group of students at the same time. In the DARPA dataset, we counted all the connections for each minute and kept this value in the tensor. So, a particular element can have a strong weight, stronger than the usual connections, and be represented in a rank. It's now time to conclude our talk. We presented the tensor data model library created to use and manipulate tensors with a strong type safety, relying on shapeless and implicit. It is a data-centric library that avoids the usual mapping between real values on integer indexes. It is also efficient at large scale, thanks to its internals based on Spark data frame. We have seen that tensors are very interesting tools to perform data mining and data analytics tasks. We have demonstrated with two datasets, one for the community detection capability among classes of a primary school, and another for anomaly detection in the DARPA dataset containing information about network traffic. As TDM is a young library, there is still plenty of features that we can add. We would like to add more data manipulation operators, for example a map-like operator, for values of the tensor and of the dimensions. We would also like to add more tensor decompositions, such as Tucker or Dedicom. We also continue our research work to guide the use of tensors for several use cases. We would like to determine an efficient way to choose the optimal rank for the Condecomparafac decomposition. We are also studying the possibility to use this decomposition by layers, by computing the decomposition, removing the entries that strongly contribute to the signal in each rank, and then re-executing the decomposition. It could, it could allow us to discover different signal intensities in the tensor that could be hidden by stronger signals. We thank you for your attention. We hope that you enjoyed your talk. If you have any question, feel free to ask us.
Hello, thank you for your talk. We have some time for some live Q&A, and I'd love to ask a couple of questions here from the stage. Mm -hmm. Our first question is, is it checked at compile time that a type cannot be added twice? And if yes, how is that achieved? Uh, yes, it is checked at uh, compile time. Uh, when you call the method uh, add dimension, it has uh, an implicit uh, parameters, and it is used to uh, with checklist to check uh, in the H in the H list we are uh, constructing that uh, represents the schema of the tensor. If we already have the type or not, so if we have the type, it won't compile, and if we haven't uh, haven't the type, it compiles. Great. Our second question. Are you familiar with other projects in roughly the same space, like Tessaronics, Java, PyTorch, named Tensors, Python, Nexus, Scala, or ND Scala? And if so, how do they compare to TDM? Uh, I've heard about uh, named Tensor. Uh, I know that uh, they use a string to, to represent dimension. So it's not really type safe because you can uh, easily uh, uh, write wrong uh, the name of a dimension in a string. Uh, Nexus, uh, I think it's more uh, a layer of our existing library. Uh, the other, I don't know them, but with TDM, we, we tried to, to rebuild a new library um, that we can use for uh, data analytics. And uh, we to guide user uh, easily with tensor that can be a bit tricky to use in a mathematical form. So that's what we try to achieve with, uh, with TDM. Great, we have time for one final question from the stage. It is, how do you store the data underneath? Uh, so we use a data frame from Spark. Uh, we do not expose it to if we want to modify the background of the library, we can do uh, without impacting, um, impacting the, the exposing functions. And uh, when we need to, for example, for the decomposition, we use an uh, alternative data structure, uh, such as uh, block matrix uh, from Spark also. Great, thank you so much. Like I said, we, uh, that is all the time we have for the live Q&A. If you'd like to continue answering any additional questions we have in the stage Q&A, please go ahead and do so. Okay. Again, thank you so much for taking the time and speaking to us today. Thank you very much.